It wasn't that long ago that Schalke 04 was one of the most competitive German sides in football, making deep runs in the Champions League, finishing second in the table, and boasting some of the best German talent in recent years. All of that less than a decade ago. But now, they're a club on the brink. You would struggle to find football fans, and especially more romantic or traditionally minded football fans, who would wish this situation upon any club. It really does break fans' hearts, I think, to see a club like that in, in such financial turmoil. Hi there, I'm Adrian, and welcome to Rabona TV's deep dive into what exactly is going wrong at Schalke. This is a video that we have spent a lot of time on here in order to give you the most comprehensive and in-depth look at the tribulations of the Royal Blues, and have even enlisted the help of Matt Ford, an English expat and football journalist based in Germany. A big thank you to Matt for his time, and be sure to check out his socials and the work that I have linked in the description. And also, if you enjoy this video, consider subscribing with notifications on so you don't miss another one from us at Rabona TV. But beyond that, let's dissect FC Schalke 04 and how their on-pitch performances have been a byproduct of the club's structure and delicate finances. It's funny to ask this question, perhaps not funny, funny is the wrong word, but surprising to ask this question when considering just how well the first half of Schalke's season went. They brought in David Wagner to replace interim head coach Hube Stevens. Wagner of course helped English side Huddersfield gain promotion to England's top division for the first time in 45 years, and in avoiding relegation upon their return, the Guardian's Paul Doyle claimed it was quote, the Premier League's greatest survival story. Things obviously didn't go well for Wagner in Huddersfield's second season, as he left the club in January with an embarrassing 8 points to their name. But considering what he achieved on a shoestring budget at Huddersfield before then, he fit the needs of Schalke given their own very fragile finances. Which of course, we'll explain later. And things started brilliantly for Wagner upon his return to Germany via Schalke, and while they had some deficiencies going forward at times, they were solid at the back. Hindsight is 2020, of course, but it appears as if Schalke was playing a bit beyond their means, both in the attack and in defense as well. Why do I say this? Well, in Germany, they divide the season into two halves, the Hinrunde, which is match days 1 through 17, and the Rückrunde, which is match days 18 through 34. After 17 matches, Schalke were in great shape, as you can see here. By all accounts, their defense was operating quite well. They were in 5th place, a Europa League spot, tied on points with rivals Borussia Dortmund and just 7 points behind leaders RB Leipzig at that time. Things were looking good, even if their attack was laborious at times. It was difficult to identify any sort of attacking plan. Uh, you're right to point out the defensive record was good, um, or at least yeah, com comparatively good under Wagner. But Schalke, have, um, even in the year they came second under, under Domenico Tedesco, have struggled for creativity, for a spark, for, for reliable goal scoring up front. And that trend continued under Wagner. Upon their return to action following the winter break, Schalke provided an extremely competent, if not impressive victory, 2-0 victory at home against Borussia Mönchengladbach, the team that was then sitting in second place in the table. And they obviously didn't know it then, but on that day, on January 17th, 2020, that was the last time that David Wagner, his squad, and the Schalke supporters would taste Bundesliga victory. Not just the last time that season, but until now, until this date, November 6th, 2020, over 10 months ago, Schalke hasn't won a single match. Hopefully, for their sake, that changes very soon. But as far as the 2019-2020 season goes, they went 16 matches without a single victory to close things out. From 5th in the Hinrunde, tied on points with Dortmund and tied for the second best defense in the league, Schalke's second half of the season was relegation worthy. And that's not at all hyperbole. Schalke were the second worst team in the Bundesliga for match day 18 through 34, with only bottom of the league SC Paderborn boasting a worse record of 8 points to Schalke's 9. I think it's, with all due respect, a difficult situation when you're relying until the end of last season on your most dangerous players being um, centre midfielders, Suat Sada and Omar Machevel. He's not goal scorers. And it became increasingly clear that David Wagner didn't have the answer to that, at least in an attacking centre point of view. And by the end of the year, they were shipping goals on the back as well. 
Again, some fans held some outside hope that a new season would bring a new lease on life for Schalke, but unfortunately for Di Knappen, there was no change, and the calamitous defense from the second half of the season, mixed in with their inability to score, led to zero change on the pitch. They opened the 2020-2021 season in nightmares fashion, leaking no less than 8 goals against Bayern Munich. They followed that up with a 3-1 loss to Werder Bremen, a team that barely survived the relegation playoff against Heidenheim thanks to away goals. And that was the end for David Wagner, bottom of the league after two matches, and you can't say they didn't belong there based on what they had done on the pitch in 2020. And so with Wagner out the door, Manuel Bohm was handed the reins, the man who managed Augsburg for nearly three years before moving on to the German U18 national side. He is yet to find his first victory for the club, and as things stand now, the record since beating Gladbach on January 17th is quite, well, shocking. They've played 22 Bundesliga matches since then, and out of a possible 66 points, they've accumulated just 8. 8 out of a possible 66. That's 22 matches with 0 wins, 8 draws, and 4 losses. But in the eyes of the supporters, can this collective failure be attributed to David Wagner, or do they agree that it's a symptom of something larger? How much blame do the Schalke supporters actually place upon him? I don't think they put a lot of blame on David Wagner himself in the same way that I don't think they put a lot of a great deal of blame on Domenico Tedesco before him. Um, I think some blame does have to be laid at the door of not just Tedesco's predecessor, Marcus Weinzierl, but more importantly, the sporting director at the time, Christian Heidel. A great deal was made back in 2016 about this uh, this new duo at Schalke. Sporting director Christian Heidel, head coach Marcus Weinzierl, who had impressed at Augsburg, um, taking them to the Europa League, for example. Nothing came of that. Um, Heidel spent an awful lot of money. Weinzierl, I think, took them to mid-table. So there's been a series of poor decision-making, general mismanagement, I wouldn't say that Schalke's support lay the blame at the door of any, of any single coach, but questions certainly have had to be asked of the, the general structures at the club, um, the decision-making structures, and that in turn feeds in back to this issue of outsourcing and whether that would be a solution to bring in more more streamlined, more efficient decision-making st structures um, in, in an attempt to, to modernize the club. H hang on a second here. What does Matt mean by that exactly? As alluded to by Matt, Schalke hasn't been run very well as of late. Despite the last decade seeing Schalke recoup around 160 million euros for the sales of players like Manuel Neuer, Leroy Sané, Thilo Kehrer, and Julian Draxler, Ford also notes that since 2016, they've spent upwards of 180 million euros on players that simply haven't left much of a mark on the club. You couple this with the revolving door of managers and sporting directors over recent seasons, plus the construction of a brand new training facility that ran Schalke a bill of over 100 million euros to build, and the financial books at the Gelsenkirchen side aren't looking anything close to healthy. In fact, as recently as the end of 2019, Schalke's financial records revealed that they had close to 200 million euros of debt. And remember, this was pre-pandemic. This was before the pause in the football calendar caused even some of Europe's biggest clubs, such as Real Madrid, to abstain from spending given they had no matchday profits to add to their accounts. And so naturally, given the situation that Schalke were in pre-pandemic, it was widely reported that of all Bundesliga clubs, Schalke were, by all accounts, the, the most in danger of serious financial problems, maybe even going as so far as bankruptcy and, um, and, and insolvency. It's difficult to imagine given the size of FC Schalke, given that Schalke is the second most supported club in Germany behind only Bayern Munich as far as members go. And support is a key word here as Schalke are a club with a structure that is becoming more and more unique within German football with every passing year. And so in order to understand how exactly they're becoming unique in their structure, we have to quickly remind ourselves about the 50 plus 1 rule in Germany, which basically states that in order to compete within the top professional leagues in Germany, the ownership structure of a given club must be that the members of the club own the majority of the club, 
or 50% of the stakes plus one. Matt will elaborate further. That guarantees that they always have that voting majority. That guarantees that any external sponsor, external investor, anybody who wants to buy shares in the club, they can buy as much as they want, invest as much as they want, but not more than 49.99%. And that guarantees that the members always have control. There are, of course, exceptions to the 50 plus 1 rule, with long-standing investors allowed to have further control of the club, such as Dietmar Hopp at Hoffenheim, or perhaps the most infamous example of a workaround being RB Leipzig. But Schalke, as mentioned, belong to a small group of clubs when it comes to taking the 50 plus 1 rule to heart and leaving the ownership of the club to the fans. The entirety of the club is owned and managed by the fans, whereas most Bundesliga clubs have outsourced the management of the football side of things to an outside organization and thus relinquishing, at least in practice, some control of the club. And so with that in mind regarding Schalke's club structure. Why does that make it slightly problematic for Schalke during the pandemic? It means, first of all, that they are a slightly less attractive proposition for potential investors. After all, if you're an investor with a lot of money, why would you invest all that money into a football club which you cannot have a, a majority controlling stake in. Without that outside investment, as mentioned earlier, the financial situation imposed by the pandemic was especially serious for Schalke, and the club was desperate to pinch any penny that they could, and unfortunately, the fans became the victims of such, once football stopped in Germany. With football stopping, TV companies obviously didn't want to pay out their broadcasting rights payments to the Bundesliga, given that there was, well, no product to pay for. <laughs> and you could apply that same sort of logic for Schalke's season ticket holders, with the pause in the Bundesliga season and matches being closed to the public upon its return, those with season tickets and executive boxes at the Veltons Arena inquired about refunds, and the club didn't exactly make themselves look like the good guys in this scenario. In a message to the owners of executive boxes on April 8, 2020, marketing director of Schalke 04, Alexander Jobst wrote, quote, the club is facing a potentially existence-threatening economic situation and is reliant on sponsoring and hospitality income more than ever. Translation, Please don't stop paying for your executive boxes. And as for the season ticket holders? Schalke then actively requested that their season ticket holders refrain from requesting from requesting a refund. And not only that, if the if those season ticket holders did insist on being refunded for the games they were missing, Schalke actually requested that they provide proof of why those fans need the money in the form of unpaid bills uh, and, and, and other invoices, um, which was quite a severe thing to come out for a club like Schalke, perhaps worse for a club like Schalke than any other, because this is a club which prides itself right from the heart on being the people's club. Now, if you've seen our video on the Revier Derby, or you're an avid follower of German football, then you will already be familiar with this. But just in case, the city of Gelsenkirchen, where Schalke 04 is based, had a population boom in the late 1800s and early 1900s as industry blossomed, namely the oil refineries and the coal industry. And Schalke, when they became an independent club in 1924, most of their support and almost the entirety of their squad was made up of coal miners, hence breeding the nickname the Knappen, a regional term for a miner. If you've ever seen the player's tunnel that leads to the pitch at the Veltons Arena and wondered why it looks so ominous, now you know. It's meant to resemble a coal mine to remind the players of where this club has come from and who they are playing for. And so, when coupled with Schalke's unique ownership model in comparison to other Bundesliga clubs, you can see how said fanbase could feel disillusioned by the club when they asked for proof that the supporters needed the money. A club that is so proud of its roots and so proud that they are one of the few that remains truly fan-owned within Germany, but hanging onto this identity in a sense is contributing to such financial hardship for them. They can feel their club's values slipping. 
the firing of what were basically retired volunteers who were getting paid a nominal monthly salary to give academy players a lift to training, asking fans to prove that they really do need the refunds from their season tickets, and of course, the dishonor that their former chairman, Clemens Tunius, brought upon the club with racist remarks, and the role his meat producing factories played in the spread of the coronavirus within Germany. This is not the club that they grew up loving. And soon, it seems likely that Schalke fans will be faced with a decision, perhaps even during the current season. Do they sell the soul of the club, so to speak, in the name of financial survival and in hopes of Bundesliga survival as well? And what would that look like if they were to do so? And that again brings us back to 50 plus one. The discussion about outsourcing the professional football team at Schalke into a separate company, a step that they've not yet taken, but that most other clubs have. That discussion is slowly looking like it's going to become inevitable. Uh, the German term for it is Ausgliederung, which yeah, it translates roughly as outsourcing or separating or separating from. It will be controversial and it could, it could potentially spark civil war among the supports, um, the supporters of against that. And there would be a similar debate over it to the debates that took place at Hamburg before they took a similar step and at Stuttgart before they took a similar step. Bear in mind that both of those clubs were then since relegated, so this is not a silver bullet, but the argument is that a professional football division separated out away from the club would be a more attractive investment proposition for, for sponsors, um, whilst of course remaining under the control of the parent club um, in accordance with 50 plus one. And Schalke, of course, has one of the biggest ultra groups in German football in the ultras Gelsenkirchen, a very vocal group that's well connected to the club, as you would expect of a club like Schalke and how they're run. In fact, and this is a side note, they made headlines recently for having a meeting with Schalke squad and coach Manuel Baum following their 1-1 draw with Union Berlin. They told the Schalke squad that while they didn't necessarily expect a win against Borussia Dortmund in the upcoming Revier derby, they expected them to at least fight to fight on the pitch and make them proud. Schalke lost 3-0. But back to the more important question. Do you think that, if you had to guess, of course, because I'm sure you haven't been polling the entire fan base regularly, but if you had to guess, would you say that most of them would be more warm to that idea if it meant that they survived, or would they rather sort of hang on to their values and maybe take their chances in the second Bundesliga? It's so difficult to predict from that, but what you've outlined is, is precisely the debate. That's the two sides of the debate. If you want to put it simply, do they want to sell what they consider to be their soul um, for financial security? Like I said, looking at the examples of Hamburg and Stuttgart in particular, it's not. this is not a silver bullet. Um, however, there is a growing feeling that, given the financial demands of, of modern football and the demands that are placed on modern football clubs, that a certain amount of financial modernity, financial security is necessary. So you can see how this is a tragic situation for any club to be in. Failing financially, failing on the pitch, losing their identity in the opinion of the fans, and there's no real end in sight or an obvious solution to their issues. The bigger threat for them financially is relegation, which is a word which you simply wouldn't have associated with Schalke in recent years. This is a team that was in the Champions League semi-final against Manchester United in 2011. It's a team that even came second in the Bundesliga under Domenico Tedesco in 2018. With 160,000 members, they're the second biggest football club in Germany. They have more members than Borussia Dortmund. However, similar things were said about Hamburg. Similar things were said about Kaiserslautern and clubs the size of 1860 Munich. It can happen. These clubs can go down. And only time will tell if that will become a reality, as Schalke certainly have it against them both on the pitch and quite certainly off of it. I thank you for watching this video, and if you learned something new, then consider subscribing with notifications on for more videos from Rabona TV. Another big thank you to Matt Ford for sharing his wealth of knowledge on German football in general, and Schalke in particular. Again, I've linked to his articles and his Twitter below so you can follow his work and follow him on social media. Me, I'm Adrian, this is Rabona TV, and we'll catch you in the next video. Ciao.